Let me tell you about a term I hate. Dumb fun. It's a dismissive phrase applied to movies that people like, by the very people that like them, when they don't meet a certain threshold of complexity. It's something like, well, I enjoyed this movie, but it didn't give me an existential crisis about the meaning of my life. It's dumb fun. And I don't like that term because it has that connotation of guilt. It has the implication that because something isn't serious or grim or complex enough, you shouldn't enjoy it even if you really do. But also I'm not a fan of it because of how it trivializes the effort that often goes into these productions. A movie can be good even if it's not particularly challenging. A movie that just wants to entertain, and successfully entertains, is entirely valid. And to illustrate my point better, Let's talk about a movie that often gets this label, Guillermo del Toro's Pacific Rim, and contrast it with its sequel. Real quick for those not familiar, the movie opens with a simple scenario. An interdimensional rift has opened in the bottom of the Pacific. Monsters begin to emerge to attack cities, and as they keep coming, governments come together to create the Jaeger program massive robots that link to the pilot's minds. Because of the mental strain, each robot needs two pilots, who link together to form a single unit. First, let's address the thing that everyone says in this movie, the direction is spectacular. The way that the Jaegers and Kaiju move have such a sense of massive scale. Every blow feels like it could shake the earth. And notice how Del Toro keeps the camera steady. Sure, there are some shaky shots but they're more sparingly hued, with a preference on nice, slow camera movements. The hues of color is also amazing, but the lighting and the high contrast, they really pop out and give the movie so much energy. It's just a pleasure to look at, and to listen to as well, because the music is awesome. But I want to dig a little deeper here. In the film's introduction, there is another kaiju attack, and our main character Rally and his brother Yancey go, defying orders so they can go out of their way to save a fishing boat. They do get the civilians out of danger, but when the kaiju attacks, it tears their unit Gypsy Danger apart, and Yancey is ripped out while still connected to his brother's mind. Rally is eventually victorious, but not without cost. <laughs> We fade to the next morning, where an old man and his grandson are searching for treasure, and they see Gypsy Danger wade back onto land, collapsing to the ground. They rush forward and find Rally still traumatized, physically, mentally, and emotionally broken. <laughs> this scene, right here, demonstrates what makes Pacific Rim so good. It's not a soldier that catches our main character, but an old man and his grandson. Rally is not an untouchable paragon of macho strength. He suffered crippling trauma. That's what makes this movie so special, that human core. It's an element that Guillermo del Toro brings into all his projects, and it comes as much from what he shows as what he doesn't show. He shows us a point of view from the ground, immersing us in the spectacle, heightening the audience's emotional reaction. He doesn't revel in the mass liquidation of human life. People are not torn to pieces on screen for our sick amusement. <coughs> sure, there's plenty of destruction, but actual human carnage is kept off the screen. It shows tensions between the characters, like a cocky hotshot who is angry at Rally for discrediting the Jaeger program, or the general who won't let Mako be a pilot. It doesn't show any human as an antagonist. They all have common goals, even if there are disagreements on how to get there. Case in point, that cocky hotshot I just mentioned, Chuck, views Rally as a liability in the missions, but he stops his standoffish behavior when Rally and Mako prove themselves in the field. One aspect I find also worth mentioning here is the explanation behind the kaiju early on. Usually this kind of information is saved for the midpoint of the conclusion, like a reveal. But in Pacific Rim, it's laid on the table near the beginning, immediately after one of the scientists, Newt, uses Jaeger technology to tap into a kaiju brain. I think they're attacking us under orders. These beings, these masters, they're colonists. 
they overtake worlds. They just, they just consume them and then they, they move on to the next. See, the first wave, that was just the hounds. Categories one through four, it was nothing. Their sole purpose was to aim for the populated areas and take out the vermin, us. The second wave, that is the exterminators and they will finish the job. And then the new tenants will take possession. Now it does trade away a bit of the mystery, but in return establishes the level of threat the creatures present and helps to heighten the emotional intensity for every fight afterwards. Beating up a dumb beast is not nearly as satisfying as beating up genocidal monsters, so this trade-off is a net gain. But most important of all, Pacific Rim is presented with an earnest attitude. And the movies I make have no postmodern reflection. They are earnest, heart on sleeve, romantic notion. And it sells things that might otherwise come across as weak. Sure, the script contains cliches. A washed up hero needs to get back into the game and work with a newcomer with a secret personal stake in the mission. There's the military man who doubles as their protective father. He got the cocky hotshot I mentioned before. These are characters we have seen in other movies. But the real problem with cliches is not their mere existence. The problem with cliches is when they feel like contrived shorthand. Here, these characters don't feel contrived, because the story takes the time to actually legitimize them. We know why Rally is uncomfortable getting back in Jaeger, we know why Chuck has a problem with them, and so on. These characters are tailored to create the exact emotional effect the story requires, and I'd argue that it's pulled off exceptionally well. And above all, it feels like a movie that everyone involved wanted to make. It brims with passion, with craft, with careful planning about what to focus on and what to leave out. That's not dumb fun. It's a meticulous vision brought to life in one of the best action movies of the 2010s. A movie that I wholeheartedly recommend. Alright, let's talk about the sequel then. I don't really like Pacific Rim Uprising. <laughs> at all. I try to give a brief summary of the plot, but honestly I have a hard time even figuring out what the plot is. There's a dramatic difference in the storytelling style. The first movie is focused and he uses a very important phrase, which leads to Kaiju emerge from under the Pacific, which leads to the Jaeger program being born, which leads to Rally and Yancey becoming pilots, which leads to Yancey dying which leads to Rally quitting the program and also leads to the Jaeger program losing support, which leads to reduced manpower, which leads to Rally needing to be re-recruited out of desperation. Uprising uses and then instead. John Boyega lives in the ruins of the Kaiju ravaged planet, and then he's helping scavenge Jaeger parts for some criminals. And then he meets a girl who built her own rogue mini Jaeger. And then there's a chase scene and then they get recruited into the Jaeger program. It makes it very difficult to summarize what happens because it rambles out of control. Everything feels disjointed so there's no sense of rising or falling action. There's no emotional buildup and nothing to be invested in. Yeah, I can try to describe some more major plot points though. There's this lady building Jaeger drones. A rogue drone attacks Sydney. Uh, they find it in Siberia. They realize it has a kaiju brain inside. And for a moment they suspect the lady, but it's actually Newt. And oh, poor Newt. Oh, they did him dirty. First of all, he has mind sex with a kaiju brain. That's a thing I had to see on my screen, and if I had to, so do you. Second of all, they pull a retcon twist, where apparently, when he drifted with the kaiju brain near the beginning of the first movie, he was possessed by one of the precursor aliens, and has been possessed since that point. Which... No. If we're supposed to hold that as canon upon rewatching, there are several points where he could have easily withheld key information or just not done his job and doomed humanity. It simply doesn't work with what we see in the first movie. Anyways, Newt wants to end the world now. And then the monsters go to Tokyo so they can use their blood to blow up Mount Fuji. And then there's a, a fight, I guess. And the movie ends with a sequel hook. Wonderful. Love sequel hooks. And also speaking of sequel, may I mention the mere existence of this movie and the fact that the kaiju are back really cheapens the triumphant ending of the original film. Sacrifices were made that don't feel nearly as impactful in the context of this movie. 
So yeah, that's Pacific Rim Uprising. And honestly, if I talked about every time the plot did something that didn't make any sense, or every time a character did something that was really utterly baffling, we would be here a while. So yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. But overall, it just feels very different. Let me break it down. <laughs> To be clear, everything I've said about Uprising up to this point have been legitimate criticisms I have. Everything I say from here onwards are just differences between Uprising and its predecessor. None of these things are inherently bad on their own. These are things that could hypothetically work when done well. However, Uprising exists as a direct sequel to Pacific Rim. So when elements that people enjoyed in the first movie aren't present in the follow-up, it can be disappointing to say the least. Especially when the story they're in is so uncompelling. The dramatic shadows and colors of Del Toro's vision are swapped for gray clutter. Character motivations are no longer delivered through dramatic visuals, but through just straight dialogue. It doesn't have nearly the same emotional impact as something like this. My dad was leading the charge, and I thought maybe I could see more of him. Maybe driven. I don't know how to get. So I climbed along my floor, just showing that he needed to be quick. Yeah. How'd you get? One step, one step, one step. How'd you get? One step, one step. One aspect people often point out is that the Jaegers don't move the same. Sometimes they move with a similar weight and scale as the first movie, but other times they move like this. <laughs> Yeah, the physics aren't consistent. Now this in itself doesn't make the movie bad, in the same way that robots being slow in the first movie weren't the reason it was good. But the difference does change the emotional impact. There's also a difference in tone. In the first movie, we suspend our disbelief to say, okay, a super advanced alien race can open a portal and engineer living war machines. From there, the movie stays relatively grounded within that premise and is written to avoid pseudoscientific terms. Yes, our universe, and here is theirs. And this is what we call the throat, the passage between the breach and us. We know that it's atomic in nature. In the sequel, there's a lot more of that. Again, contrast. So it's gone. Well, gone is relative in the digital realm. By running a modified fractal algorithm, I might be able to reconstruct a few megabytes. Mount Fuji is active. A geological pressure point. Based on the blood to mass ratio of the Kaiju, the reaction would cause a cascade event. And it begins to edge into that flat out ridiculous zone. Once more, being ridiculous in itself doesn't make the movie bad, but it does have a dramatically different feeling from the first film. The dialogue also feels a lot more quippy. There's a way to have funny lines that build characterization. Talk about this for one second! One. Don't you ever touch me again. Two, don't you ever touch me again. Here the hues in place of characterization. Never seen snow before. So out of all the things to notice right now, you're noticing snow. Big dead kaiju is just, it's right okay, there. Okay. Sure. A particularly big sticking point, the optimism is gone. Del Toro had a vision where humanity, and I quote, set aside old rivalries for the greater good. Instead, here we have irreverent cynicism that just feels crass and abrasive. Here we see kaiju crushing people, we see the death. In the first movie, the Jaegers made selective use of items in the world to fight with. Items that had no people around. In Uprising, they are literally pulling down buildings to use as weapons and causing wanton destruction. Roger that, ships. Everyone in the city is secured in underground shelters. <laughs> But most of all, the sincerity is gone. The first movie feels like Del Toro saying, I see something beautiful in the giant robot versus kaiju subgenre, and I want to share that with the world. The second movie feels like, hey, aren't giant robot movies dumb? Isn't this movie dumb? We're gonna talk about how dumb it was for Pentecost to give an inspiring speech in the first movie. Is this the part where you're gonna give me one of those big dumb speeches? Does everyone uh, think just, it was dumb or is that just your opinion? It was just to be honest, how many times did you practice that in front of the It was motivational. Okay. You can be whoever you wanna be. And no, it wasn't dumb. 
because Pacific Rim built up to that moment. Sure, it's a trope we've seen in movies before, but they put in the emotional legwork so that this meant something. It galvanizes the audience as we go into the finale. Today we face the monsters that are at our door and bring the fight to them. Today we are canceling the apocalypse! <laughs> Pacific Rim may not be a Criterion Collection candidate, but that doesn't mean it wasn't crafted with great care. It deserves to be remembered better than a dumb, stupid movie by audiences and critics. And it deserves to be treated better than as a dumb, stupid movie by its sequel. Because it takes an entire team of very smart and passionate people under very smart and passionate leadership to make something as good as Pacific Rim. Uh, that concludes this video. Thank you for tuning in today. If you have any other movies you'd like me to discuss, feel free to let me know in the comments below. And if you want more of me, you can follow me on Twitter or Letterboxd for more updates. Until next time, I'm Daniel Goldhorn, and thanks for watching.